Our founder, Ernest Holmes, who, like a lot of spiritual teachers and mystics, bring forward uh, metaphorical and allegorical ideas to that we can grab a hold of to construct our spiritual constructs. Because these spiritual constructs that we work with in our lives can feel unwieldy, they can feel large, they can feel incredibly mysterious. And so the idea of being able to bring forward, forward some sort of vision. I was reading recently that when anthropologists look at our ancestors as far back as they can go, um, we think of those ancestors, you know, what, 100,000, 150,000, whenever it is. They say that somehow, in some way, shape, or form, the conventional wisdom is that we've been around for about 200,000 years. And when you go back there, and we think of, we imagine their lives, hunter-gatherers, and what that must be like from sun up to sundown, and living in those environments, and and how you know how how arduous that life must be, and how demanding it was, and yet the anthropology keeps unearthing the, these little ideas that show that our ancestors were spiritually minded. And what is the tip off to that? Are symbols that they start to find. And what we know about us as human beings, our ancestors, and us today, is that a construct a symbol, an idea, a picture worth a thousand words to bring these deep, mystical, universal ideas into our grasp. Now, our founder, Ernest Holmes, he returns to a theme that you see that's it's, it's taught throughout religion and theology and spirituality and that's the idea of water. And I was, I was looking at water the last couple of weeks in my pile of books that I use, and water's got all kinds of meanings through religion and spirituality. But I want to focus on one of the meanings today. And our founder, Ernest Holmes, he, he had a brother, Fenwick Holmes, who was a minister, a congrega- congregational minister, I believe. And... Um, and they wrote a poem, an epic poem together called The Voice Celestial. And it's in those traditions of the, these great, long, you know, volumes of poetry on a particular theme. And Ernest Holmes paints a picture in there, and he and his brother, that's very poetic and very gorgeous, very beautiful. And he gives us the ocean. And he, he paints a picture of, of walking along the ocean and staring into the ocean and you know, and I, I think I think of him because we know that Ernest Holmes loved the Pacific Ocean. He loved the beaches, especially in the Monterey area. And so you think about Monterey, that kind of fog, that mist that comes in, and and the and the and the waters rolling in, and it's such a beautiful place. And the sands, and we see seashells coming up, and we see seaweed coming up, and and he's walking along. And I imagine his little bare feet with his little pants rolled up a little bit, and they're getting kind of wet and kind of squishy, and he's feeling it, and he's looking out there. And he talks in, in the voice celestial about this great mystery, on being on the edge of the great mystery. You know, and that imagine, imagine as we all can, the ocean, and to just be there. And it is, it is this deep and, and mysterious and primal, place of creation and power and energy you know i did a i did a turn in the navy when i was younger and i remember i i crossed i was on a ship we crossed the atlantic into uh we went into the mediterranean for about eight months on a cruise and most of the time you're at sea you can't see you know you don't see land or anything but so but but especially what i remember is the atlantic and the atlantic was so had such energy, and, and I don't want to use the word, but it could be beautifully violent, and it could be, you know, could, and I was on an aircraft carrier, which is a pretty big boat, and we get to rocking sometimes, and you go out and you watch the waves break into the hangar bay down below and, and come up, and it was just this very powerful place. And I, earn, I, I understand Holmes uh, bringing that forward because we, want, we, we never want to, to diminish this power of, of spirit or God or creator, whatever we want to call it. We want to know 
that it's deep, and we want to know that it's powerful and it's filled with energy, and it is the, the seat of creation. We want to know that. But then he brings up, in a lot of his writing, he brings up another idea around creation, and he calls it the fountainhead. And he talks about, now imagine, so, so what I like to do with the fountainhead, now obviously you look at a statue and you see the fountainhead, but what I like to think about, for, especially for the sake of today, because Ernest Holm gave us permission to interpret things the way we want, so I want to interpret something different, okay? All right. Okay, so I want to go to the fountainhead. Now, Ernest Holmes talks about the fountainhead being the direct access to spirit, and so a good way to put that would be intuition, you know, like, we're going along, you know, we're encountering something new. Maybe we have to make a change or figure things out. We really don't know what we're thinking about. And all of a sudden, we, we, we start firing on something. We start getting, you know, we start opening up to uh, a direction. We start opening up to ideas. And, and so he talks about that in terms of intuition. He talks about that being direct access to the, to the eternal wisdoms. And uh, Charles Fillmore, uh, in the Christmas, in the whole Christmas narrative around angels and stuff, he talks about, he, he, he equates angels as intuition coming, he says, they come to us directly from the fountainhead of the eternal wisdoms and knowledge. I love that. So they kind of shoot in on us and they play their little harps and stuff. And, and that's, that's that intuition coming up, right? But anyway, I want to I think of it in terms of things like the headwaters or the watershed. Because there's another type of God that I need, I find I need. I don't know about you. And that God that I need is, it's always going to be a mystery, but I need, I need it to be a little bit more accessible, a little bit more transparent. That's why I like the idea of the, the watershed and the headwaters. Our geocultural ancestors for this area. What do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of us come from wherever we come from ancestrally, but geographically, we have, we have ancestors unique to this place. And they were the Native Americans. They were here for hundreds and thousands of years. In this valley where we live. And each year... Most of them made two migrations. They made two journeys. And one of them was that once winter had kind of worn off and spring had shown itself, they began to make a journey up into the high country. And I'm thinking of the Feather River watershed right now. This is true throughout the entire Sierras, but I want to think about the Feather River watershed. And there are two places to, I mean, I'm sorry, there are three places today in the Feather River watershed. One of them is the American Valley, which is where Quincy is. One of them is Indian Valley, which is where Greenville is today. And one of them was called Big Meadows, which is where Almanor is today. And if you go into those places back then, if we could, if we could all get into a time machine, go back a few hundred years ago, each of those valleys before, before water systems were engineered, we would see these great wetlands, beautiful, gorgeous wetlands. Now, those aren't exactly the headwaters of the system, but let, let's get close, okay? And what makes those watersheds up there and those wetlands so special is that because the season up there of the spring and summer is so compressed at times, that when life breaks loose in a wetland, which is, if you ever want to see life break loose, I mean insects, birds, fish, frogs, go to a, go to a wetland. It's just on. It's just like, it, it's beautiful. There was a gentleman named Rod Giblet. I hope I get his name right. He's a writer and academic. In fact, he's a, he's a Henry David Thoreau scholar, and he says, because of Thoreau with pond, the pond and everything, I'm going to read him in a moment. But uh, Mr. Giblet says, wetlands are, wetlands are maternal as they give birth to new life, all the while nurturing it. I love that. That's a wetland. You got, you got dragonflies and all these insects, and you got the birds chasing them around. You got snakes in there, and you got raccoons. And, 
And uh, a couple hundred years ago in the state of California, you would have grizzly bears, you would have elk, you would have pronghorn antelope in there, and deer teeming with life. But the reason I think about the, the high altitude wetlands is because, because of the compressed season of spring and summer and the fact that, that wildlife, you know, the, those we call it wildlife, all those beings we share this world with, they have the ability to sense a season as it comes on. Now, once upon a time, we could do that too, and maybe some of you can do it, but and what do I mean by sense of season? All of a sudden, you know, shed fur, grow fur, change colors. Um, create life, birth life, nurture life, transition life at just the right time. And so when I was a child... I inherited a, a concept of spirit. Well, it was called God back in those days, and God was a male. I had a construct of God that I did not feel like I could get a handle on. And, and because I absorbed that as a child, it has lived in a pocket of my consciousness that sometimes I wish it did not occupy. It's like... Imagine the CEO of a big corporation, and all you get to see is the door. <laughs> CEO. And I don't know. Who is this guy, person? What, what do they do? It was like that. And so our, our geocultural ancestors would make the journey to one of those valleys up there. And all the different tribes and nations and clans, and everybody would come there from the entire region. And they would know each other. Sometimes they would have relatives with each other, and they would come into those valleys. In the summer and the spring, they would dance, and they would sing, and they would light the fires at night, and they lived in this place. And I imagine the children, the children who were there, who were raised every year going into those wetlands, and what they experienced in terms of watching life in front of them. It's not like the ocean where it's so dark and big. It's like, it's right there. It's eggs and tadpoles and frogs. It's fish. It's dragonflies. It's insects that swim. It's insects, you know, it's birds. It's everything. And they're watching the cycles of life. They're watching this cauldron of creation, a cauldron of creation. In metaphysics, our relationship with spirit is to work with spirit, to, to, to climb into what it takes to manifest and to build and to bring forth whatever it is we want to bring forth. And those, those little ones, every day got up and after they had breakfast or whatever and they went out with their moms and they gathered the grasses for the baskets and they fished with people and they hunted with people and they chased bullfrogs around. And they lived in this magical place that was filled with this life. And so, Ernest Holmes brings forward that idea of, of the mystery also. He says, now, I'm going to give you a quote, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with it a little bit. I'm going to use words that kind of pertain to watershed and wetlands, if that's okay. All right. So Ernest Holmes, of the spiritual importance of the terms fountainhead, okay? The founts, he says, from which we gather foundational knowledge. Well, what were those kids gathering up there? Foundational knowledge. Life. They were chasing it. They were living it. They held it in their hands. They experienced it. Profound ideas, wisdoms, spirituality as an atmosphere of good. An atmosphere of good. You know, I was told as a kid God was good. Didn't always buy that. You know what I'm saying? You ever read the Old Testament? Right? 
w without a mentor, you know, don't go into the Old Testament alone, okay? Take somebody with you, all right? That's a scary place. Ernest Holmes says, for good springs forth from that never-failing watershed, that's Andy, of life, which quenches every thirst, question, imagination, and yearning whose source is in eternity. Wow. Wouldn't that be great if you were a kid to ground your idea of spirit in that? Well, guess what? You can. Keep coming here. Okay? So why, why is this so important? I was listening to NPR one day a couple weeks ago. And they were doing a story about all of us, really, with our screens today, our computers and our phones and whatever screens we have, because a lot of us, you know, we're, we're, that's where we get our information, and this is where we do social media, and this is where, for me, it's work. I spend a day and a half every week on my computer at work doing file work, every day. I mean, I mean a day and a half out of my week I spend in front of that computer. And so they were talking about some of the physical challenges with that that are coming up that, you know, the people in the medical world are starting to notice, it. you know, frontal face kinds of headaches, eye issues, things like that. So some, some doctor somewhere came up with this, uh, uh, a, uh, an approach to this that they call 20, 20, and 20. And so this is it. Every 20 minutes, take a 20 second take a 20-second break and focus on something 20 feet away. That's the formula. They say if you, do, if you do that, you can help yourself, okay? So I, I, I heard that, that one day. I thought it was really interesting. But being who I am and what I am, I was thinking, okay, okay. And I, actually, I've been practicing that the last couple of weeks, and I found it's really helped. But what other kinds of breaks am I taking? Am I taking a spiritual break? In this day and age we live in where it's not just our computers and our screens that are coming at us, it's what's on those things. And it's what is coming at us, you know, depending upon your job as well. And you know, you know what's, what's really interesting? You know, in metaphysics and spirituality, we talk about a higher truth behind a truth. How many times do you have, I mean, God bless people, how many times have you had someone in front of you who is going to shove a material, ugly, dark truth as the ultimate? No, Andy, you don't understand. This is true. There's nothing going to change this, this darkness, this whatever it is. And it's like that energy that comes at you is like, whoa, right? And sometimes when they leave the room, you need to take a break. Yeah, a long break, you know? Andy, what have you been doing for three hours? I'm taking a break. That last one that came in, man, I mean, I'm, I've been slimed, you know? <laughs> you ever watch Ghostbusters? I've been there, right? So I wondered what kind of, what kind of a break I take. And so last week I, I was here, and Reverend Lisa Carson spoke last week. And she said something that struck me. And I, I don't know if I'm going to get her verbatim, you know, because I, after it was over, I wrote this down really quick. So this is how I absorbed what she said. She said, that which has given rise to the seedling and the universe, don't we think it knows what it's doing? I love that. That takes us back to the wetlands. The wetlands knows what it's doing. What we owe ourselves every day that we live our lives is to take a journey from time to time and to go back and touch the spirit that we know, to touch the spirit that makes life, births life, nurtures life, lives life, transitions life, and we take that into our hearts. That's what we have to do. Henry David Thoreau said, hope and the future for me are not in lawns and cultivated fields, not in towns and cities, but in the gently contained and quaking marshes 
I love that. I'm not hating on towns and fields and stuff. It's just what that represents. And so we talk a lot about spiritual practice. And we can get really ornate with spiritual practice because sometimes that's what the human condition needs. But I would say that we, each and every day, I know this for me, and I'm, so I'm the first one I'm talking to here, is we got to take a break. And we got to go back to the wetlands and sit with God for a while. All right? Thanks very much, folks. Namaste.